okay, y'all. Sometimes I feel like my mom when I say things like that. So we got three today. Up first, King of Swords in reverse. Let's see. Um, it represents quiet power. Calling your attention to fixed attitudes or opinions that need questioning. Okay, so we're moving in our quiet power and we are keeping an open mind about our observations and our behaviors and our actions and other people's behaviors and their actions and oh thank you the next card is ace of wands in reverse um Trials and tribulations that you will face in the near future. You can sense an idea emerging from within, but are uncertain what form it will take or how you will manifest it. Delays, setbacks, and disappointing news. Okay, okay, okay. Oh, thank you. So the last card is the Page of Wands. And let's see. You can feel the stirrings of something new emerging within you, but you don't know how to turn it into action. Someone adventurous and lively who falls in love quickly but may also get bored quickly. Represents bad or delayed news and setbacks. Represents initiative, ambition, drive, and desire. The freedom to do what you love and what you want. A free spirit who carries infectious enthusiasm into your situation. A person in good attire. <laughs> okay, okay, love it. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you. I'm going to explain to you the coin that birthed this episode. So, I was at this little bookstore downtown. And I can't remember how long ago. But it was relatively recent. Definitely like before I started the pod. Um, my sister was there, and I probably was only there to get incense and other supplies. And while I was waiting for her to check out or something, I was struck by this beautiful sculpture. I did not recognize her, but I also, like, couldn't look away. Um, and I felt this, like, certain sort of magnetic or energetic pull to her so I asked um the lady work in the shop if she knew who this captivating woman was and she looked it up on google and wrote it down for me and on the drive home I just remember um, my sister and I could feel like this beautifully overwhelming energy of love and freedom so she's here now and we've been vibing for like a couple months now at least um yeah so after i finished my tesla series i felt this bittersweet void like feeling um and i knew my next subject was on the way and i was excited to meet it and watch it unfold um and honestly, I wasn't feeling like my best that morning. But despite that, I decided to get ready and go out into the world. Um, obviously, I had to cleanse. I had to cleanse myself and my rocks. And I had to set my intentions before leaving my sacred space. Um, and as I was cleansing, I 
thought about that little statue and I, oh, if I didn't say this already, it's Nefertiti. Um, <laughs> but okay, so I was cleansing and I thought about her and I was like, because by this point, I felt like we were already like connecting um like energetically obviously and um yeah so anyway I was cleansing and I thought about her and I was like in my head I was like hmm, I wonder if Cleopatra would like some cleansing and immediately I felt so guilty and full of shame because I called her by the wrong name um it was like, I don't even know where that came from kind of moment. I was like, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but I felt her energy kind of like laugh it off um, in a both stern and like nurturing sort of way. And I let it go into the clouds. Um, and later on that day... I was at this thrift store, like, at the edge of town, and um, I was browsing the book section, like, forever, because, like, that's, I don't know, like, it's such an easy way to grab onto signs if they're, like, in the form of words <laughs> popping out at you, so, um, yeah, so I was, like, not really finding anything, though. And I was about to leave, and I looked up, like, at the bookshelf in front of me, and I saw this book titled Nefertiti and Cleopatra. <laughs> so now we're here. And this might be the start of some sort of series, because I'm, like, so interested in this and I would love to learn more about um honestly just like so many aspects of this story <laughs> um because there's like obviously it was like 3,000 years ago or something like a long ass time ago so we don't have um like we don't know everything like there's a lot of mystery here and I'm so interested in it um so yeah, it might start some kind of a series. So let me know how this inspires you and what you want to hear next through email at vannasvoicepodcast at gmail.com. But let's get into it. So both of these women were Egyptian queens, kings, pharaohs, rulers, however you want to call it. Um, but Cleopatra and Nefertiti's lives were more than 1,000 years apart from each other. So in this episode, we will be focusing on the life of Nefer Nefer Frui in Nefertiti. She was born in an unknown location to unknown parents at an unknown time under an unknown moon phase, but it seems like she had one or more sisters, and other than that, there are just a few theories about where she came from. There is speculation that she was not from Egypt, or maybe just not from a royal family, or maybe she was and her husband was her brother, but there's really no evidence of any of that. Um, one theory is that she was the daughter of powerful Egyptian advisor named I and one of his wives, Tay, I believe it is. Hold up. <laughs> okay, I I'm pretty sure it's Tay. So one theory is that she's the daughter of I and Tay. Um, <laughs> German Egyptologist Borchardt asked the question, if I's title father of the god 
could mean father of the queen. And Tay's title, the nurse who fostered the divine, could mean the nursing mother of Nefertiti. Um, so in 1360s BC, Egypt was thriving and sort of isolated from the rest of the world at this time. Um, Nefernefru in Nefertiti, Nefernefru in Nefertiti marries King Akhenaten at age 15 before he's a king and before that's his name and before that's her name. <laughs> so a small background on Akhenaten. Um, he was never meant to be a king, but that just became his fate when his older brother died. Um, at this time, people of Egypt worshipped many gods, uh, like multiple gods, and not like small, like many <laughs> gods. <laughs> like, um, like they just were worshipping lots of gods. Um, and that was like one aspect to the way that his brother ruled. Um... So, after Akhenaten became king, he inherited the throne, or I don't know how it works, but he became king, and after that happened, it kind of came out that he only worships one god, the sun god. Um, and then he made that an aspect of like the way that he ruled. So, this was different for Egypt because this god was not anthropomorphic like most of the other Egyptian gods and goddesses that they were used to worshipping. Um, Aten what that's the god the sun god uh was represented as the sun disc so basically it's like they're used to worshiping a bunch of gods and all of these gods that they worship have like human characteristics to some extent um and the sun god doesn't. It's literally just like the sun. So it's different for them. Um, so anyway, it seems like um, Nefertiti and Akhenaten were fond of each other because this soon escalates to like an ancient Egyptian power couple situation. Um, they moved to a different city, changing the capital of Egypt during their reign. And they also established this new way of practicing religion and rule together. Nefertiti is the only Egyptian queen at this point to rule with her husband. Um, and this period of time is known today as the Amarna period. So Akhenaten maybe probably had multiple wives. Obviously, things were a little bit different then. But they must have been intimate because she ends up having six daughters. In the fourth year of Akhenaten's reign, he moves the city to a new city. And he says that, like, the Aten helped him to discover this location. And it was, like, a virgin land. Like, it hadn't been dedicated to any of the other gods. So it was really just, like, perfect for them. And it was, um, 
like um like there was like a half circle of like hills hills or like rocks or something around it and then um they were also like right next to the Nile so it was just perfect location um and yeah so he moved the city to a new city and he calls it Akhetaten meaning the horizon of the Aten um and it's located between the ancient Egyptian cities of Thebes and Memphis on the east bank of the Nile so now commonly people really just refer to this um city as Amarna um so the queen at this point had three daughters and possibly another on the way when she traveled 200 miles down the Nile to see her new home by the time she arrived, it was stunning, and there were countless scenes of their lives together being carved on monuments everywhere. I feel like this is the equivalent to, like, when he buys you a house. <laughs> um, in art history, this is when naturalism begins and this royal couple probably played a huge role in the development of it. It's said that they freed artists from the cage of perfection and that allowed artwork to come alive. This is kind of when movement is introduced into art. They're depicted they're depicted as being warm and affectionate with their children, and they're shown doing more casual royal life things. This never happens again in Egyptian history. Um, but period Amarna artwork shows bodies in a more natural, healthy, fertile way. They're shown having bellies and wrinkles and wider hips and thighs, with slim calves and elongated faces and feet. They kind of look like really pretty aliens. Um, it is kind of a little bit strange though because as the pharaoh, Akhenaten would have had complete control over the artists and the artwork being produced and distributed. It seems like he was mostly concerned about religious symbolism. For example, in some artwork from this time, he is portrayed as having both male and female characteristics. This could be because his god is genderless with no human traits at all. So being portrayed like this could potentially help him to connect with Aten, his god. Um, before they showed up to this party and became Egyptian royalty. Um, the artwork in Egypt was basically just like strictly gods and goddesses. Um, and during the Amarna period, with only having the one god, the sun god, to worry about, um, the artwork became exclusively like uh, in and the royal family. Um, and some people in the city, like in the background occasionally. Akhenaten had contents the Aten, Aten, Akhenaten. Nefer, Nefer, Fru, Aten. Nefer, Titi. Okay, so Akhenaten had contents the Aten, I don't know why I keep on to say it like that, I don't think it really matters that much, I'll just continue, we'll see what happens, Akhenaten had contents the Aten with her sweet voice and other nice and loving things about Nefertiti inscribed, um, 
all over the place. When she was first discovered um, in the images and artwork that we found from this time period, many people thought that she actually was a goddess. Um, But this was ruled out when evidence presented itself that she was married to the king and that they had six daughters together. But the depictions of her next to God are very interesting and definitely giving some goddess energy. Um, She's pictured in equal or almost equal proportions to Akhenaten in just about everything. There are carved scenes of her in a warrior type role, which is, it was common for a king. Um, But like this was... Like, she did a lot of shit that was, like, queens don't usually do that type of thing, you know? Um, She's mostly shown as feminine, except for in this scene. Um, And ultimately, she's just shown as an equal ruler. Um, But the name God is almost constantly reversed to face her, which is interesting <laughs> um so nefer nefer frui in nefer titi and akhenaten officially changed their names during their reign akhenaten means in the spirit of the aten nefer titi means a beautiful woman has come and she added nefer nefer frui in meaning Beautiful are the beauties of the Aten. Names were very important in their culture because they believed in order to have eternal life, one's name must be spoken after death. So defamation of their name after death was one of the worst things that could happen. Although she may have gone by different names at different points in her life, The queen is well known today as Nefertiti, but she would never have been called anything but Nefer Nefroi in Nefertiti in Amarna. So they worship one god, the sun god, Aten. This is kind of like the world's first real organized monotheistic religion. So kind of a big deal. Um... As some of you in the jewelry industry may know, (laughs) that cross with the circle on top called the Ankh, um, that symbol is shown back in this time period uh, in artwork as a gift from the sun to the kings and the queens, and it symbolizes the sign of life. So there you go. Um, Around the 12th year of Akhenaten's 17-year reign, things start to get a little fuzzy. Um, Maybe Neferfruaten, Nefertiti can no longer have children, but she would have recognized that it's crucial for their royal standing at the time to have a son. Um, Sips tea. (laughs) So this other lady, Kaya, begins giving birth to the king's babes. And one of those babes is King Tut. Um, yeah, so also around this time, there's an international pageant where a bunch of people from different countries come to bring tribute to Egypt, and basically they just give the royal couple a bunch of things and then leave. Um, also the couple's second daughter, um, I think it's pronounced Makatatin, dies, And it's really sad, and the deep grief this caused is shown in her tomb carvings. 
Um, after this happens, Nefer Nefer Frua in Nefer Titi is officially named as the co-regent beside her husband before his death, making her a second king to Egypt of completely equal power and status. After Akhenaten's death, Nefertiti takes responsibility as his successor. It seems she chose to live in a palace that Akhenaten built for her with three feet thick walls, and she possibly changed her name to Smenkare, um, but nobody really knows why or if that's like 100% accurate. Um, at some point after this, Akhenaten's son, King Tut, uh, marries his half-sister and Nefertiti's third daughter, Akhesinpa Aten, and they take over as king and queen. Um, king Tut moves the city back to the city and basically restores the old ways of doing royalty and religion in Egypt. They both change their names to Ankesanamen and Tutankhamen to further prove the point that they do not identify with the views of their parents and they stand with the people in polytheistic worship. Um, apparently, King Tut died before the age of 20 and he left no heirs to the throne. Um, after the age of Amarna, we have no records of Nefertiti Akhenaten became known as the heretic king for trying to establish monotheism. Um, and everyone moves on and forgets about this iconic 15 minutes in history until many years later, the bust of Nefertiti is discovered by the German Oriental Society in 1912. Um, this happens during an excavation at Amarna. Um, immediately, Hitler is like, wow, I like that. Like, he's real proud of it. Um, and despite one of his peers telling him that they should return it as a political gesture, he says, I will never relinquish the queen. And... They hide it in the salt mines during the Berlin bombings. Eventually, American troops find it uh, near the end of the war. Egypt requested that they return it, but they refused and told them to take it up with the new German government. So now it's in a museum in Berlin. This item and others like it are apparently presented as being from dead civilizations. And of course, the museum is being weird about it, like no pictures and no, you can't have it back. So two artists um, from Germany, I believe, their names are Albadri and Neles. Um, they have some theories about why this Berlin Germany museum is weird about the bust of Nefertiti. Um, one, they make so much money from like the tourism and the exclusivity of it all. Two, if you have an item, you also have the privilege of telling the story behind it. And the story that they tell is fictionalized to some extent, as is any interpretation. Um, so these two artists, um, they decided to secretly 3D scan this bust in this museum with an Xbox scanner. And 
they released the files to the public for free. Um, it was like top secret activity. And they also made a 3D print um, of the bust. And they were presented with the opportunity to gift it to a museum in Egypt. But they thought about it for a minute and they decided it's not the right move. So they stuck with their original plan and buried it in the Egyptian desert in attempt to reunite it and reconcile how it was discovered in an excavation, which is kind of a more Western practice. Um, so maybe it'll be found one day and maybe it won't, but that's not the point. That's not why they did it. Um, there's really no way for those files to be 100% accurate. Um, but their main goal here was to open the conversation to a wider variety of people. It was like a scandal with purpose. People who are interested in 3D printing, for example, and maybe have never thought about if the bust of Nefertiti should really be gatekept in a museum in Berlin instead of at a museum in Egypt where it was created and discovered. Um, they just want to make it possible to tell new stories about it and props to them because here we are. So the location of Nefertiti's tomb is one of the biggest mysteries in Egyptian archaeology. Finding the queen's tomb will be the most significant discovery since they found King Tut in 1922. Um, but tomb raiding and robbing has been a problem for a very long time. And back then, it was the responsibility of the priests to protect the mummies of kings and queens. So it's possible that their bodies were moved because that was one way that they could attempt to protect them. Um, so yeah, as always, I do not have a way to close my episodes yet. <laughs> but it was really nice talking to you today. And I hope that you are surviving this retrograde. By the time you're hearing this, it's either over or very close to over. So love you. Oh, thank you.